I'm actually going to start with a video that I saw last night after the rocket attacks were taking place on Israel, the first time ever in modern Israeli history that we were directly attacked by Iran. And it's very important to say directly attacked by Iran, because Iran has been attacking us for years. It's been attacking us by Hezbollah, it's been attacking us by Hamas, it's been attacking us by, by terror groups associated with the Palestinian Authority, the PLO, and Judea and Samaria. It's been attacking Jews all over the world. Uh, the, the, what's the building in Argentina that was bombed years ago? The JC, the, 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 the Jewish Community Center in Argentina? That, that was an Iranian attack on Jews. In a, all right? And so Iran is behind attacking Jews, not just Israel, but Jews, and then obviously also Americans, Britons, for years. But last night we experienced the first time ever that Iran attacked Israel from Iranian territory. So that's a huge step, which I don't know whether we're going to get into tonight, but it shows that they, be, they believe that they have the power and they are empowered for the first time ever to attack us directly because they sense that the Jewish state of Israel is weak. Weak on an international level because unfortunately uh, the Biden administration is supporting our enemies more than supporting us and def defeating our enemies, unfortunately, and also because they think that we are internally divided, which we're not, and I might get into that as well. So what's the video that I saw last night? And this is what we're really here to talk about. There was a video of a protest, an anti-Israel protest, I don't know exactly where, it might have been on a college campus, just, just yesterday, with everyone screaming, cease fire now, cease fire now, cease fire now. Now, people who see or hear the narrative on the media every day of people saying cease fire now, what are they led to believe? Cease fire now. Meaning that, oh, those people care about life, those people care about human rights. Those people care about peace instead of war. Right? So, of course, ceasefire now sounds, makes sense. That's the human thing to do. We're brought up of values of caring about life, caring about people. It makes sense. That sounds like what I should be part of. And if I want to be part of my social network and I, I want to be looked on as someone that cares about life and the right values, I want to be part of calling out for ceasefire now. Right? Then the video continues. Someone comes into the video and screams, Iran's attacking Israel! And then all of a sudden, those same people who are screaming, cease fire now, start cheering. <gasps> cheering. Iran attacking Israel! Yeah, Iran! Go get Israel! Yeah! That one little video shows the reality of our absurd reality that the media is not telling, but worse that our media is not telling, that our youth are falling for, not understanding what in the world is going on. Because they, on college campuses, you're looking after your social status. You want to be the in crowd. You want to get good grades in class. And all of a sudden, your friends or your social networks or your study groups, they're anti-Israel. And it's not just anti-Israel, they're saying bad things about Jews. Jews run the world. Jews are doing bad things to America. You're a Jew. You're, you're, you're in charge of genocide. You're a child killer. Right? And it's not just collegiate. It's not just their friends. It's college professors in class taking a stance. Israel is bad. Hamas is good. Hamas has a right to do what it did. And you have our youth. Our youth. And again, whether they're collegiates or whether they're high school students. I, I call it as if they're deer caught in the headlines. They're like, what in the world is going on? Because if you're a rational thinking person, after October 7th, Simchat Torah, when the Jewish people experienced the worst pogrom, the worst massacre of Jews since the Holocaust, you'd expect any decent thinking person who believes in human rights, who believes in life, 
who believes that rape should not be used as a military weapon, they should be sympathizing with the Jewish people in the Jewish state of Israel. And yet we're living in this alternate reality where not only are we not receiving the sympathy, anyone who is Jewish, and we'll get to that in a second, is being attacked as the enemy of the world. Yes. <laughs> the, uh, we're, the e we're, we're behind every evil all of a sudden. And then when I talk to college students or, or youth, I'm like, why are you being attacked for what's going on in Israel? Why, why are they screaming at you for being a child killer? Why are swastikas being being drawn on JCCs or Hillel's or, or outside the doors of Jewish students in their dorms, they don't even know if you've ever been to Israel. They don't know your political stance. They don't know you're religious, you're secular. You know, they don't know what you're connected. You right wing left, you, you support the Israeli government, you don't support Israel. Nothing. Why, why are they attacking you? It's because they're a Jew. And unfortunately, what, what saddens me and what brings me to tonight and what I'm here doing this whole week is trying to wake up Jews to understand where this hatred is coming from. Because the Jewish world is not explaining it. Hardly any Jewish organization is able to explain it. Hardly any educational institution is able to explain it. Not on the middle school level, not on the high school level, not on the collegiate level. <clears throat> With all the organizations talking about fighting anti-Semitism and give us more money to fight anti-Semitism, they're not able to fight anti-Semitism because they're not able to define the anti-Semitism. And I'm, the, I'm a big believer that if you go to a doctor and the doctor gives you a wrong diagnosis, doesn't make a difference what medication he's going to give you, it's not going to work. The only way the medication will work is if the doctor gives you the correct diagnosis. And we're living in a reality where our, the Jewish world, the Jewish world, and not just the Jewish world in America, but the Israeli establishment, the Israeli government, the official Israeli institutions and organizations behind standing up for the Jewish state of Israel today and explaining our situation to the world, they're not giving people the correct diagnosis, and especially our youth, to understand what they're up against. So what? Why am I? So why am I here? Why, why do I care about that? Because I come from Israel, and I'll go talking a little in terms of October seventh and the impact on Israeli society today. I'm also a believing Jew. I know we're going to survive. The Jewish people in the state of Israel, we're going to survive. All right? How? Because we're a strong people, a strong-willed people, we're becoming more united each day. I'll get into that in a second. But I believe God above is, is taking care of things, even if things look bad. And things are going to get worse, we're going to get out of it. What I'm afraid of is I'm afraid of the Jewish kids and the Jewish youth and the Jewish collegiates here in America who, because they are not being given correct information, they're being made to feel embarrassed of being Jewish, and they're running away from their Jewish identity. Yes. And the only way to help them is by giving them the correct diagnosis of what's going on. And that will uh, give you what the correct diagnosis is. But the, once you get the correct diagnosis, then you have the medication, then you have the cure. And the cure is the proper education and the proper tools for them to feel true pride in their Jewish identity, which is connected to their Jewish history that goes back thousands of years, that Jewish history that goes back to Judea and Samaria, and to the Temple Mount, and not to feel embarrassed about the state of Israel, not to be ignorant about their Jewish history, but to own it, and then be proud of it. 
And that's information that, again, as Stephen introduced me, I pride myself on the, the work that I do being the inspiring, politically incorrect truth. And that's why the Jewish establishment and the Israeli government are not saying what needs to be said, because it's politically incorrect. And too many of our organizations, and even too many of our rabbis, and rabbis who I love and like, they're unfortunately more afraid of losing members and losing donors and not saying what needs to be said. It's terrible. That's the reality. That's the money. That's the reality of our, of our world. So that's where I come in, in order to give the added information that others are not willing to say. Because I'm not complaining about them. I'm saying, I understand your predicament, but I'm here to do what you're not able to do. And it's not just me. I have a whole staff. We sit in Jerusalem. So now let's go down to the diagnosis. Why is a college kid or a high school kid being attacked wherever he is, in Kalamazoo, Michigan, if he has nothing to do with Israel. And this goes back to a conference that uh, my organization ran in Jerusalem in, at the Begin Center in June. And it's something that I've been talking about for years and I wanted to get a bigger audience for it. So we had a conference. And the title of the conference says it all, and I'll do a little deep dive. The title of the conference was Unmasking the Anti-Semitism Behind the Palestinian National Movement. Simple. Because people today think, oh, we're supporting the Palestinians because they belong to Palestine, and therefore the Jew is the outsider, and the Jew is the occupier, and the Jew is the oppressor, and the Jew is the one doing apartheid and genocide, yada, 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 yada. And it's all based on a lie because our Jewish world, including the Israeli government, is not giving the proper information about this Palestinian national movement. And this hatred growing today is what I call the biggest blood libel in Jewish history. Does anyone who knows about the blood libels in Jewish history, the original blood libel called the blood libel is that the Jews used Christian blood in Nazis, which obviously never happened, right? But when that blood libel was used, it caused pogroms in individual communities in Europe. Today, in the name of the cause called Palestine, you're having Jewish kids, Jewish collegiates, Jewish adults being attacked all over the world. The biggest blood libel against Jews that has ever existed. Now, why is this a blood libel? Very simply, and this again is information that's not given out there, and it should be given out there. And I'm going to give a couple different data points, and you can all fact check me on this. And this is all information that our kids do not know because it's not politically correct. And there, here, hence, it's not told by hardly any organizations. Data point number one. Everyone just do a Google check or an archive of the newspapers before 1948. Simple. Check who was being referenced when the term Palestinians was used. The Jews. Okay. Everyone knew before 1948, in the 40s, the 30s, the 20s, Palestinians meant Jews. There was the Palestine Post, run by Jews. The Palestine Electric Company, run by Jews. The Palestine soccer team, that traveled all over the world, okay. Jews. Everything was Jews. And you go to those same newspapers, and then it says, the Arabs attacked the Palestinian Jews. Right? The Arabs did this, the Arabs did that. There were no, no nation called Palestinian. So that's data point number one that's important to internalize. I don't know how many of you knew that, but I take a guess how many of our kids in colleges know that, or in high school know that. Maybe a tiny percentage. Let's, let's go further. That's data point number one. Data point number two. Data point number two. Has anyone ever actually looked at the, the text of the United Nations Partition Plan of 1947? Yes. Okay. What does it call for? The creation of two states. Which two states? 
An Arabic state and a Jewish state. An Arab state and a Jewish state. With only 23% of the original British mandate. Right, so the state for the Arab... Tiny, tiny, tiny piece. Right, and the point I'm taking that in is that there is no mention in the, the United Nations partition plan of the Palestinian people. They're called Arabs. And no call to create a state called Palestine. It was a state for the Arabs and a state for the Jews. Meaning, even according to the international community, it was known there is no entity called Palestinians with a historic claim to, to the Jewish homeland. Let's go to data point number three. And these are all simple pieces of information that you don't need our conferences or lectures for, for kids to understand. Between 1948 and 1967, who was in charge of Judea and Samaria? And who was in charge of Gaza? Judea and Samaria was the Jordanians. Jordanians were in charge, right? right? So for 19 years, for 19 years, was there any call for the establishment of a state called Palestine? Adam Palestine was in 65, 64. Okay. Sorry. So first of all, okay. So first of all, and it didn't allow for the establishment of any universities in any of those territories. Exactly. So, right. And Jews were forbidden to go there, right? But in any, but the bottom line is, for 19 years, no Arab living in Judea and Samaria or Gaza asked for the creation of a Palestinian state. No country in the world asked for the creation of a Palestinian state. The international community didn't ask for the creation of a Palestinian state. There's no, there were no people called Palestinians that deserve the state. How many of our kids know this information? They don't. Right. And then the final data point, as was mentioned, Arafat established the Palestinian Liberation Organization in 1964. Two very important pieces of information regarding that. First of all, if the West Bank, which is really Judea and Samaria, and Gaza belong for Palestinians, why did they create a liberation organization? They had it. Because it wasn't about attacking Jews and Judea. It, it, was, it was about destroying the Jewish state yes. of Israel. Right? Okay? And then the second point and what most, what most people don't know is that the whole Palestinian identity was created by the KGB in the early 1960s to destroy the Jewish state of Israel. Definitely. Even though the Soviet Union is gone and the KGB is gone, that is the most successful disinformation campaign of the KGB. Because it's turned into a global blood libel where Jews even in Kalamazoo, Michigan, are being attacked for being Jews. And this is all simple data points that can be proven simply. And none of our kids know this information. Oh, oh. Sir, why, why did the KGB want to do that? Exactly. What, what was their stabilizing position in the Middle East? Because Israel. What was their uh, old war? Huh? Is old Israel. War. Is, old war. You have to understand that, yeah, there's the Cold War going on, and. Uh, the Israel was not under the Soviet umbrella, and they didn't want Israel to go to the American umbrella. They saw Israel trying to get closer with America, in a sense. So they wanted to destroy Israel, and in that sense also harm America, because they, they saw Israel as being the, the beachhead that America could have in the Middle East, that all the Arab countries were basically under the Soviet block. That makes sense. Got it? Yeah. Okay. Did you have a... Same question. Same question. <laughs> Okay. All right. So these are all these are all very simple data points. Now you have now you have the correct diagnosis. You have the fact that we are all being attacked all over the world for a for a cause that is a fiction. Doesn't even exist. The Palestinian people don't exist. You want to call yourself Palestinians today? No problem. Call yourself whatever you want. But that doesn't give you historic rights to our homeland when you are created by the KGB in the 1960s and you have no right to that land. And if anyone who really does a deep dive into the identity of the, of the Palestinian Arabs, their whole story is stealing Jewish history. And I'll give you the, I'll give you the, famous, the, the famous picture that says it all. They like to say that we are occupiers, right? All one has to do, and all I have to do to show a picture when, I, when I'm talking to youth or collegiates, I show them the picture of the Temple Mount. I'm like, here is the wall that Herod built 
in the year and whatever, whichever year it was, at the turn of the century, right around then for the second temple. And here is the Dome of the Rock on top. Yeah. Who came first? Yeah. <laughs> it's in the picture. That's it's still. in the picture. That's still. All right. So, but but, but most, and all of a sudden they feel, oh my God, that, that, that's right. <laughs> and and they only came fifteen hundred or oh, seven hundred years later. History is important. Our kids don't know history. And I don't want to give them long history lessons. You don't have to give them long history lessons. But the, the basis is, first, they're not being provided the correct diagnosis. And I'll tell you this story, because this story, personal story, still happens today. I was sent as part of a, of a delegation of the Israeli Foreign Ministry to college campuses. And I was in California at Berkeley University. This is 2012. Right? Twelve years ago. And we get into the middle, and, and they sent us then during anti-Israel apartheid week, right? So you have all this street theater and all the anti-Israel stuff taking place. So we're in the middle of Berkeley campus, and they have this apartheid wall, and they're acting like Israeli soldiers. They're dressed up like soldiers, they have like toy guns, and they're pulling people's hair, and throwing them to the ground, they're pointing the gun at them, like trying to portray us as Nazis, like literally. And then you have all the Jewish students in Berkeley, and Berkeley are pretty smart students, right? And they're standing there with signs that say, Israel wants peace, Israel is the startup nation, Israel supports the two-state solution, Israel created the cherry tomato. And I go up to them, and I go up to them, like, yeah, this is serious, this is really, and it still exists today. And I, and I go up to like the Hill director, I'm like, listen, let me help you. Write me, a, get, write a sign that says, I'm an IDF soldier, ask me anything. I was an IDF soldier. I served in Lebanon, I served in Gaza, I served throughout Judea and Samaria. And then I walked into the middle of their street theater. And then I just like got everyone to be asking me questions and then basically telling them the truth. And I told the Hillels, the Hillel students, like, guys, your goal is not to, to, to fight or argue with the anti-Israel activists. You just have to have enough information to know, to show that they don't, they don't know anything what they're talking about, that they're clowns, so that the students just walk by. But our students don't have enough information. Exactly. Not at all. And hence, they're not, and hence they're not able to do it. And on college campus today, one second, on college campus today, it, they, many organizations say, oh, we don't want our students to have to defend Israel. Whenever I talk to college students or high school kids, I'm like, you don't understand. I want you to learn the Bible. I want you to learn Israel, Jewish history. I want you to learn modern Israeli history, not in order to defend Israel. Believe it or not, Israel's going to be fine whether you defend Israel or you don't defend Israel. On your campus, on the street, Israel will be fine. You're defending your Jewish identity. By you not knowing this information, you're not you're losing your Jewish identity, and you're being embarrassed by your Jewish identity, and many of them are running away from it. That's why you have to know this information. And now I'll go to the security... Um, Keep on trying to think of new things for Howard and Carol. So I'm going to go to the security situation. Today, we have unbelievable technology. Today, um, Gaza, we're sending in tens of thousands of soldiers in order to fight Gaza. I served in Gaza back in 1994. 1994. I was the last unit that pulled up our base in the middle of Gaza City. Not the middle of Gaza, but the middle of Gaza City. Right, because there was the Oslo peace, pro the peace process, and it meant that Israel had to pull out all of its forces out of Arab cities in Gaza and Japan and Samaria. So we were the unit that was there. Before we had to pull out, the worst terror we had to deal with in the middle of Gaza City. I'm walking through the alleyways of Gaza City. That's my my, my army um, uh, assignment. The worst terror we had to deal with was rocks being stoned in front of us. Rocks. In 1994. Today, to go into Gaza, we need tens of thousands of soldiers. We had more peace before the Oslo peace process. We were able to defend ourselves and have a better life for the Arabs before the Oslo peace process. And I also served in Judea and Samaria. In Judea and Samaria, I learned how to cook rice on a rooftop in an Arab uh, Muslim village called Anabta outside Tulkarim. 
I, I, because we had stayed there for Shabbat, we had to cook our own food. I had to call my mother, how do you make rice? That's why I learned how to make rice. I learned from my, my friend how you make schnitzel. That's why today, like everyone else, to come to our house to get good schnitzel. I learned how to make schnitzel on the rooftop of an Aptat, right? Guess how many soldiers we were to provide security in this one Arab village back in 1994? Three. Not bad, we were four. Four Israeli soldiers to be able to provide security in an Arab village. That's an Arab village of thousands of people. It's not like five houses. Today, you have to send in hundreds of this IDF soldiers from all different special units if you just want to go in and arrest a terrorist. We used to just go down the door, knock, and back then we used to tear down their PLO flags because back then it was illegal for them to have a flag of an enemy entity. Look, look, where, we, look where we are today. We're in a totally different world. And we're in this world because official Israel and the Jewish world accepted the false identity of a people called Palestinians. Now we get to the point of why our kids are not able to defend themselves with all the existing educational programs out there. Right? And some of them are doing great work in giving them good Jewish history, Zionist education. But just this week, I saw a video of one of the star educators from one of these organizations that are getting millions of dollars. And she's telling these students on, in, the, in, the, in the classroom, in this college classroom, saying, yes, the Jewish people, this is our ancestral homeland, and it's also the ancestral homeland of the Palestinian Arabs. The second we say that, you mm -hmm. just pull the rug out of our legitimacy to stand up for ourselves. Because the KGB were very smart. Very smart. Okay? They knew by creating a false identity that's connected to a historic name of the land. Palestine was a name given by the Romans. Okay? By creating the identity called Palestinians, it automatically has someone believe, oh, Palestinians belong to Palestine. Palestine belongs to Palestine. It's, it makes sense, right? So the second the, 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 the government of Israel in 1993 accepted the Oslo peace process and the whole Jewish world went on board accepting that there is an entity called the Palestinians, we have no leg to stand on. We're the occupiers. Yeah. Okay? It belongs to them. We're the occupiers. We have nothing to stand on. So whenever our kids on college campus are saying, no, we support the two-state solution, we keep on saying yes, they keep on saying no, who cares? Who cares? We're not supposed to be there. Once you accept the paradigm that Palestinians exist as a historic nation, we have no right to be there. And what the message I give over to kids is, folks, oh, wait, let's take a step back here. Why are you called Jews? Because we come from Judea. That's the real historic name of the area, and that's our ancestral homeland. Why are Arabs called Arabs? Because they come from Arabia. Arabia, which is Saudi Arabia. And then you break it down for these kids. So how are they Arabs everywhere across the Middle East? Well, go back to your history books, folks. The Arabs are the biggest genocide, conquering, occupation, colonializer, entity, society in all of history. Because they started in Arabia, and then over the years, they conquered by the sword and forcefully converted every other minority. And that's why they're now all across the Middle East and Northern Africa. And Michigan. They, and in Michigan. Wait a second. <laughs> that's right. And they, and they even took over Spain and Portugal for a little bit. But now, even today, like if, if Americans have no clue. Westerners have no clue. To this day, at this moment, every day, Christians are being massacred in Nigeria and Kenya by Muslims. Every day. It gets no headlines. No one cares about it. It's like we think people don't care about the Jews. People don't care about the Christians. Don't care about the Christians anywhere else in the world. But it's this. Con it's the continuation of the Islamic Crusade. It's happening right now. They're the biggest perpetrators of everything they blame us for. How many of our kids know that? None, because they're, they're, they're every, like I say, everything we're told in the media and everything's being told on in college campuses is 180 degrees from the truth. So this is, this is our situation today. And hence, what me and my team are trying to do is reach out to these collegiates and high school kids to provide them the tools. And we're going to find out which kids are able to use those tools to use their own voices. 
Because let's face it, all these kids are on social media today. Instagram, TikTok, everywhere. Okay? I don't want a 20-year-old to see a video of 50-year-old Avi Avalo talking no matter how passionate I could be or how convincing I could be. I want a 20-year-old seeing his 20-year-old friend talking about these issues and using his own creativity on Instagram and TikTok, etc. to be able to be convincing his own network of friends. And that's one thing that has yet to be done with these youth, to give them the tools and the proper education that is not being given by anyone else so that they can be vocal and they could be influencing their networks of friends. It's not about fighting against the anti-Israel uh, activists. That's, that's, a lost, that's a lost cause. They're unfortunately, they're brainwashed. It's not for the college kid. It's not for the high school kid to do that. But what, it will, what we are able to do is help them save their own Jewish identity by providing them with the information, and then helping save their friend's Jewish identity, because, hey, they're seeing their friends making all this social media content that they are now understanding, oh my God, this is information I wasn't given before, and helping them feel empowered, a stronger Jewish identity, and therefore able to feel as a, a proud Jew based on the truth, based on our true history, and not based on the atmosphere of lies and hate that is going to be getting worse day by day. And it is going to get worse day by day. It's not getting better because the media is against us, the universities are against us, and I'll go another, uh, give another, well, how do I know the universities are just going to get worse? And again, it's only, and again, my, the line I've been telling everyone is if you have kids, if you have grandkids, whatever, or thinking about college, university today, first of all, definitely don't go to any Ivy League university. <laughs> Waste the money. Marxist brainwashing and uh, just plenty of hatred where they already don't want Jews. But tell them to think about going to Israel. They're in a proud Jewish environment with a good education with no anti Semitism in their ancestral homeland. And uh, the other thing, it's important that kids internalize to help get rid of all the lies. And it's such a simple fact. And fact check me. But so far in all my talks, no one's challenged me yet, but I'll say it again. Two basic facts, two, two basic um, things that's important. Number one, Israel is the only country in the Middle East where a Sunni Muslim, a Shiite Muslim, a female Muslim, a gay Muslim, an atheist-born Muslim, have freedom and equality with Jews, Christians, and all other minorities. But that, that should be celebrated according to today's value system, right? And it's every other Arab Muslim country that you're persecuted. If you're in a Sunni country, you're persecuted. <coughs> then the Shiites are persecuted. You're a Shiite country, Sunnis are persecuted. Christians are persecuted everywhere. The Jews are persecuted everywhere. Christians are persecuted everywhere. Jews, all minorities, Yazidis. Israel's the only country that stands up for freedom and equality for all, for everyone. And yet we're the ones who are vilified. Right? And then the second point, which again goes back to owning and being proud of their Jewish identity. The whole um, uh, narrative on college campuses today is oppressed and oppressor. Right? It's all black, colored, white, right? all this, making everything simplistic. The beauty about the Jewish people is we don't complain about our victimhood. Yet we're the most victimized, persecuted people in all of history. 2,000 years of exile and persecution, exile and persecution, exile and persecution. The Holocaust 80 years ago, right? And yet, not only do we not focus on complaining about our victimhood, we move forward in being victors and focusing on building, and we built our own state to be one of the unbelievable shining countries in the world. For a country smaller than the state of New Jersey, I think we're the 14th most booming economy in the world. Doing technology and medical interventions and, and, and aid for, for, um, for, what's the word? Developing disasters. For disasters. We're helping the world in so many ways. And that's despite that we were persecuted and exiled for so many years. And we overcame it. 
Like we should be the poster child of every college campus, the poster child of every university professor. Oh my God, we're talking about the press. Look at the Jews, they overcame it all. Look what they accomplished, they're doing so much good. It's like our kids need to know this. They don't, they don't know it, they don't even know their own history to internalize how proud they should be in their Jewish identity. So I believe our challenge right now is not ignoring the growing Jew-hating anti-Semitism today, post-October 7th, which has people just totally confused about. But to take the bull by the horns and finally provide these kids with what they need, with the education and the tools that they need to deal with it. And obviously adults as well, but let's save the kids because they're the ones who are most vulnerable to be running away from us. And that's what we're providing, and I'm looking for the supporters to help make that happen. Obviously, any level, I mean, I would love to find all those big donors who are pulling their million-dollar donations out of the universities. Because here, you're pulling it out because of the growing anti-Semitism, don't give it to me so I can help fight it. But any level of support, whether from you or people you know who I should meet and be interested in, uh, and interested in meeting or be interested in, in, in supporting this, let me know. So again, thank you so much. Video. Oh, I have to show you the video. Jews worldwide today feel trapped as victims of the most virulent hatred since the Holocaust. They are confused about why they are having to defend their very existence as Jews. Some have even lost friends. And they are realizing their lack of engagement with our people in Israel and our ancestral homeland of Israel has left them in the dark. So where are all the Jewish educational institutions and organizations that operate on college campuses? And what in the world have they been doing all these decades with our children who then proceed to college? Why are so many Jewish kids today without the tools to advocate for themselves? Sporting teams have an offense and a defensive line of players. No game can be won with only one of them. So why do organizations today mostly only play defense, highly focused on fighting the daily lies about Israel and the Jewish people. At Pulse of Israel, we are going to change the approach and go on the offensive with young adults from coast to coast. We recognize that at the core of the growing anti-Semitism today is the Palestinian National Movement. Our goal is to work with students, your children or grandchildren, and coach them so they have a clear understanding of the history of our people, the history of our people in the land of Israel, and the history of our people as it relates to global policies and the war against Israel and the Jewish people today. We do this in a way that will give them the tools to effectively engage in being vocal. Being a strong Jew is necessary now more than ever. And we know how very scary it is for these kids in the public atmosphere today. The Pulse of Israel Warriors Project will work with high school and college students so that they can effectively engage both the obvious anti-Semitism and the nuanced anti-Semitism that they may even encounter in a classroom setting. And this refers to a professor who takes a political stance in front of the whole class being aligned with the enemies of Israel. How should a student respond in such a situation? In addition to providing daily communications featuring top viral ideas for posts, weekly mentorships and monthly Q&A sessions with influencers and thought leaders will also be, to be made available for the students. We are going to work with the young warriors and give them the tools necessary to address any anti-Semitic encounter they may have while in high school or in college. We anticipate that this will have a multiplied effect and will in turn inspire thousands of students from coast to coast of the United States to want to engage with our Pulse of Israel Warriors project. The advantage of approaching anti-Semitism in this way, which is unlike any other organization that engages high school or college students today, will help to instill a Jewish pride that establishes a natural connection through the information and tools they receive to their brothers and sisters in Israel and their ancestral homes. Join us today. And I'll just end by saying this is work that I have been doing with my team since 2006. 
and we've been doing it online all these years. And finally, because the need is so great, um, we're going offline, and that's why I'm out speaking to uh, try to really make an even bigger impact and reach even more people than, uh, than before. So thank you very much for coming, and thank you, Rochelle, once again. And any, any leads, any donations, any insight is greatly, greatly appreciated. And any questions? For, what? When are we need to back for Israel? Tomorrow morning. Why? What are you, what are you thinking of? Um, my, I've been very involved with Kabbat in Fort Lauderdale. My son, is with the rabbi's son-in-law and a Jewish teacher, started C Team finally after eighteen, like about fifteen years of trying to start it. They have a hundred kids. Amazing. Amazing. Half of them, a bunch of them, are going to college. This is a really the right time, the right kids. And there's a there's this inertia and momentum. I would, which is the Chabad rabbi? Which, which the main one is Moshe Meir Lipschitz from Chabad Lubavitch on Fort Lauderdale okay. Beach. They've been there 34 years. I mentioned to Ali this project that we was, began discussing realize. today about the big the, international even Shabbaton for college age. Yeah, we were, we're, we're, the, yeah just, we're just working on that now. Yeah. That'd be a great. These play. kids were all supposed yeah. to go to the C team in New York, but just. Interesting logistics. Didn't All right, happen. let's let's get your information um, and let's. But uh, they just had a Shabbat home with thirty kids two weeks ago. Okay. Teenagers and the teachers and the rabbi. Okay. Stephen, get information. Let's be in touch. Let's make it happen. Yes. yes. Just ask something as I raise my hand. Please. It's so funny. We have. Uh, let me be very briefly about what happened after after October seventh. Everybody was so broken hearted. And I invited some of friends and clients, mm -hmm. and this is my daughter, my that's hot, Michelle, Ali, and a few other people. We started a women's group every Monday night here at Tolkien, mm -hmm. and you know, mm -hmm. helping each other, mm -hmm. how to move through what we could do. And actually, in January, we started as a result a YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. We call it Salon, and from today, we call it Golda's Girls. Golda's Girls. Golda's Girls. You see, that's a good time. My daughter mm -hmm. found it out in the morning, so I'll thank for that. But why I wanted to say why I'm mentioning this is also the same that we need to we need to we need to step up we need to get it out. But about just before I came here, I had an interview for this channel with SSI students supporting yes. Israel. Yes. 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 And I had the the, the director and her name is uh, Rebecca mm -hmm. Mann, and she actually told me. But that's why I raised my head right away. Yeah. That in Berkeley, what she said about the anti-apartheid week, what they did was an apartheid, Palestinian apartheid week at Berkeley. And they had there on the college, and Berkeley is terrible, I think, yeah. what I know of, and they had this, the Palestinian apartheid week, and they gave all the other information, and it was so successful. So I found it very powerful that yes. you brought that SSI up. Yes, SSI is one, is one of the best Isn't it nice? Have. Isn't it nice? Yeah. And yes. today we had this, and it's like wonderful and yes. so positive. And uh, yeah, it is. Sounds like sharing yeah. this. No, thank you so I'm much. Are you familiar with Masha? Yeah, Z Street. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, uh, Club Z, sorry, Z Street, Club Z. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. So, I'm. Because I'm, 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 they're training. Yeah, they're training high school kids. Yes. Right. So, I'm looking at taking it to the level the of online. Week. Exactly. So, I'm looking at getting this up and running. And I've reached out to Masha mm -hmm. to work together and plug her, her kids into it 100%. Yeah. We need to yes. help each other, for sure. Question. Yes. Where did the RS come into the picture? Sounds familiar. Steven, I want to ask you a question. Steven, when did they come to the land? So, if you go back to the British censuses yes. of the end of the 8th, 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, they came in for work from the rest it's of the Ottoman so Empire. Exactly. They you came for so work. They're not from. You, it, all you have to do is check their names. Their names are Egyptian cities, Syrian cities, Lebanese cities. Uh, there were some that lived there, and it is interesting like because Jews. because some of, because most, if not all, of the Arabs who lived in Israel for hundreds of years, because there are some, well, they were mostly all Jews who were forcefully converted hundreds of years ago. So for instance, there was an Arab village outside of Hebron called Yata. Yata, you go look at the houses if you get there, because it's very dangerous to get there, because it has the highest percentage of terrorists. 
in Yatta. And then you know, I'm an organizational psychologist, I didn't give you my professional background. But uh, you just go to the psychology of it. Yatta was is known today to be a Jewish village. You go to the houses, you see mezuzahs were on, were on the doors. And as a way of uh, proving themselves to the rest of their Arab Muslim world, they are doubly motivated to commit terror attacks and kill Jews because they want to prove themselves. Hence, Yatta is that. But a majority of the Arabs came the end of the 20th, 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. Wow. And nobody, oh, there are some people not. And only if you just look at the censuses. Most of the people do not know. No, they don't know. Right. And that they weren't all Arabs. Of course, some of them were Ottoman Turks, but some of them were Europeans because many of them came from what's now known as Macedonia, from Albania, from Bosnia, from Herzegovina, all over the and they weren't even Arabs at all. Like, what's the crazy, the, re, the redhead that was elected, the redheaded uh, girl? Yeah, the Arab, the Arab. Yeah. The, and she, her, her family was from Albania. They weren't, oh, yeah. they weren't, even, they weren't even Arabs. Uh, Yat, Yata is that where Yat, adjacent to Yatir? It's in the area, but it, it, okay. Yatir is a little, little southern, okay. more south. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I'm interested in the uh, distribution and reach of your message and messages. Uh, you said that uh, you know part of it is you getting fundraising, obviously, and you're using those funds to you know spread your message through social media mainly, right? But you mentioned the most effective method is to enlist. Yeah, well, are you enlisting? I guess my question is people who are like in high school to spread your message for you, so that they can identify with people their age. Yeah, no. But how are you doing that? How are you figuring that out? Yeah, so we have what we, we, we have the con we have the staff to, this is something we're getting up and running. We have the staff to hire, to reach out uh, and get collegiate cinema relationships with some of the, frater the Jewish fraternities and to get the students on board and, and high school students on board. Um, and the funding is for the educational costs to, to make it happen and the money to promote their messages. Meaning once we have them on board creating their own content, then it's good about helping them, them get them, it seen by tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of, uh, of, 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 of youth around the country to be making the impact. That's, those are the two things with the, what the funding is exactly for. And like you know, social, social marketing, and you give the presentation instead of me, that's the highest cost. Because I think for us, uh, let's say a view would be like 20 cents a view, so you're talking a dollar for five. So we're talking about to be able to reach uh, 50,000 views or 50,000, so that's $10,000 that's $10, right there. So the, the bigger the budget we have for the marketing component, the more youth we're able to reach using the, the social media tools and, uh, and paid um, opportunities that we have available. On another note, altogether, like, I think after October 7th, we, when we went to the the lecture at the shul, that's what I needed myself. Stand with us. You know, like, how, where is the, in, how do I cons consolidate all this information that I've been trying to research, and yet it's just endless. I didn't know how to compartmentalize it and give it that nugget and make it right, right to the heart of the matter. I needed that right. to respond to anti-Semitic information. Right. So it's interesting if the students tell their parents, then you're empowering two groups. But there's plenty of people that just need that information. Exactly. And again, the, the biggest problem is, it's like, I call, I'll use the term, I call it whack a -mole. Every day it's the, the flavor of the day lie against Jews. Every day it's a different lie. Whether today it's we attack the hospital, and tomorrow it's that we killed 13. And the next day, it's uh, who knows what. Every day, they, they are brilliant, or the aid workers. Every day, it's another lie. And therefore, our organizations are totally focused on just helping fight the lies. And I mean, I'm on, I'm on so many WhatsApp groups, and everyone's about, oh, this, this is the real information, let's get it out there to fight the lie. It's all fighting the lies. And that's important too. It's not, that's not important. But that gets 99.9% .9 of the information and the funding. But that's but our kids and even adults, like you're attesting to, that doesn't let give them the sense of pride in the justice of our cause. And I'll, I'll, and I'll end this inspiration. Okay, we'll end with this inspiration to tie it all together. And I know it's getting late and anyone else wants to ask me questions, come up to me afterwards and anyone who wants to leave can leave. <laughs> 
the um, even though the Jewish society in Israel is extremely sad and extremely and living in a state of trauma, and we're going to be living in a state of trauma for a long time. Yes. Okay. But has, has, who here has been to Israel since October seventh? I'm going in a few weeks. We are going. Going in a few weeks. Okay. So. Ken and Judy, you've also been, no? Like not since I've heard that. No, no, no. Okay. Ken, would you agree with me that the atmosphere in Israel, while one of sadness, is one of unity and sense of purpose? Absolutely. I was there for a month, but I was there the whole month of January. And I was all around the country. And yes, absolutely. Okay. Okay. So I mean, if I if if every Jew had the, the means, and if every Jew with means actually did this, the most important thing to do today is go to Israel. Not to see the kibbutzim and to see what happened. No, none of that. Just to be in the Jewish state of Israel today, the epicenter of the greatest tragedy that happened to us, and be uplifted by the state of the Jewish people in Israel today, despite that. And be there. And, and you, you feel it, that the union, and not to believe any of the headlines and the news of dividing and there's hatred, da, da, da. don't believe it all. That's just the horrible media doing its horrible job. Um, but reality on the ground is the Jewish people have never been more united with a unity of purpose. Because the Jewish people understood on October 7th, and again, this is why like, no matter what pressure from the Biden administration to force a two-state solution, it's never going to happen. Because the right, left, religious, secular, they, they learned on October 7th, our enemies are killing us, not because of where we live, we but are. because of who we are. Who we are. Yeah. And in Israel, that it's has been right. understood. And hence, there's a sense of purpose, and there is an uplifting spirit of one's Jewish identity. Uh, again, I'll tell the story that I had to tell a week into the war. A, father, a, a, a father's daughter that joined the Israeli army, and he reached out to his daughter and from a religious family, and he goes, Ah, oh, you're going to be able to find a nice Jewish boy to marry. Hey, right? because Jewish and Zionistic, right? the values for our family will be a good foot fit for you, right? And the daughter contacts the father and says to her father, said, Dad, that would have been fine a week ago, but now every Israeli soldier is wearing tzitzit and a kippah. You don't know who's religious anymore. <laughs> <laughs> now, it, that's a little exaggerated, but it does give over the actual atmosphere. The most famous song sung today by soldiers, whether in Gaza or coming out of, not even Ami Shalai. No? Nope. No. Ani Mami. Oh, Ani Mami, I believe. Why? Meaning, even secular or not necessarily religiously uh, uh, educated youth have a deeper sense of a spiritual connection to their Jewish identity. I didn't bring it. I, forgot, I forgot my uniform. I usually bring my uniform. So on my uniform, and I'm sorry I forgot, I'm so tired, so <laughs> I guess for us, you have to forgive me. Um, on my uniform, I have special patches. Like it's really, this idea of soldiers are wearing different types of patches. You have thousands and thousands of Israeli soldiers right now wearing patches, and I would have shown you on my uniform, which is in the car downstairs, of the temple, and of the word Mashiach, and of the word uh, 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 Mila Shem like, uh, uh, like God loves us. And not just religious soldiers, because all of a sudden you have Jewish soldiers realizing, wait a second, they named this war the Al-Aqsa Flood. I don't know how many of you are familiar. The official name of the war of Hamas is the Al-Aqsa Flood. Okay? They're not fighting because we live outside of Gaza. They didn't massacre and kidnap us and burn our children because of that. They're fighting to take over Jerusalem. They think it's a religious war. Yeah. So Jews are now waking up in Israel and realizing, wait a second, if they're fighting out of their religious conviction, we have to own our Jewish identity and stand up for who we are. And we're about the land of Israel, Jerusalem, and our purpose one day to rebuild our temple. And that's you have thousands of IDF soldiers walking around and fighting in Gaza and Judea and Samaria with patches of the temple. Right. And not all religious. That is a feeling of and an uplifting spirit together with the sadness and trauma. 
when you feel that uplifting spirit. So if you have not been to Israel yet, come to Israel, volunteer, be there, feel part of it, be invigorated, and then hire a good real estate agent and start looking for good properties to purchase in Israel because no matter how expensive they are today, they're going to be more expensive tomorrow. So now is the time. So thanks again. Pulse of Israel, frontline videos from the Holy Land. Support our work by donating today.